So testing and deployment is the last part of the infrastructure landscape that we're going to cover. It, the outline of the lecture is going to talk about the concepts, um, how, to or, like, how to think about what should be tested, what should be monitored, stuff like that. Uh, cover a paper from Google called ML Test Score, a rubric for production readiness. Talk about some kind of, or, you know, the software that's out there for continuous integration and testing. We're going to cover Docker in more depth than yesterday. It's uh, very crucial nowadays. We're going to talk about deploying to the web. We're going to talk about monitoring. And we're going to talk a little bit about deploying to hardware and mobile. So the first thing I want to start with is the project structure. So what I mean by that is how should we, how should we structure machine learning code bases what should be tested? How should we name different things? Um, and the way I think about it is the goal of a machine learning code base is to produce a prediction system. It's a system that's able to take input and produce prediction output. So it takes input, constructs networks with trained weights, because remember, a machine learning system is part code, part weights. And then it makes predictions using that code and those weights. Now, to generate the prediction system, there is potentially a separate code base that's the training system. Now, they could live in the same repository, but conceptually, they're different code bases, and they might have different requirements. The training system processes raw data, runs experiments, and then manages the results. For example, picks the best model out of a number of experiments. And finally, the prediction system has to be deployed for some kind of end user access. And we call that the serving system. So the, the goal is to serve the predictions. Uh, ideally, it scales to demand if it's a web endpoint. Sometimes you have one user. Sometimes you have 1,000. Sometimes you have you know, hundreds of thousands of requests per, per minute. Um, and so we've got to be able to scale to that. Or alternatively, if you're deploying to, let's say, a phone, I could say, you know, satisfies the constraints of the system. Like, yes, we trained a prediction system. Can we actually serve predictions on our end user device? So the thing that comes into play in machine learning systems is the training data, training and validation data. So you kind of think of it as the training system and the data coming together to produce the prediction system. Now, when you actually deploy the prediction system and now it's serving predictions, it's seeing a different type of data that we call production data. And we assume it's the same type of data as the training and validation data, but it often is not. Um, to test our prediction system, I like to make a conceptual difference between what I call functionality tests. And the role of the functionality tests is essentially to test the prediction system on just a few important examples. So stuff that you really want to get right, it would be very embarrassing to not get right. Uh, or potentially it's crucial for whatever business reasons you have that on these examples you're not making a mistake. It should run pretty quickly. Ideally, you can just kind of run it as you develop things so that you know that you're not badly breaking things as you're developing. Uh, it should catch really the code regressions. So the idea is like, oh, I just made a typo in my code and now stuff doesn't work at all. That's the role of the functionality test is to make sure that that's true. Or so, uh, someone else is getting set up with my code base. I want them to be able to run the prediction test at least. Then I know that they have at least some kind of baseline. But then there's also validation tests. And the goal there is to test the prediction system on some kind of validation set. So it's trained on the training set. And then maybe we care about performance on a validation set. We start from process data. Uh, so not necessarily raw data. And then it should run in like less than an hour. And the idea is that like every time we push code to our continuous integration system, we'll run the validation tests, make sure the accuracy is not decreasing, not catching us off guard. And the idea is to catch model regressions. So maybe I introduce a new type of model or I update the weights. Uh, it'll take me too long on my local machine to just run it on all of my validation samples. But I'll push it to my continuous integration system. It'll run there. I'll get alerted if, it, if, it's, a, if it's a regression in performance. The training system, like I said, is kind of conceptually a different code base. And it should have its own tests. So 
what you want to do here is really test the full training pipeline. You want to be able to go from the raw data, so ideally just even download the data. Um, you want to run it in like less than a day, ideally. Most models, I think, are trainable in less than a day. Uh, to, and then the, the goal here is to catch upstream regressions. So what do I mean by that? Let's say your raw data is generated from some kind of process that runs and it touches your logs and your database and like some images you put somewhere. So at some point, someone else working on the, whatever you're working on changes the database schema. And so now the training data that you're pulling down is in a different format than what you're used to. So that's not going to break your prediction system because that's already trained, but it will break your training system. And the only way you'll find out is uh, next time you train. And if you train like every year, then you'll find out in the year that like a bunch of things are broken and, and you don't know what exactly. You know, there's a schema change, the images may have been deleted, something else might have happened, TensorFlow got updated, now it doesn't train. Um, and the idea is that with the training system tests, you run them on a regular schedule. And so as soon as something changes, you're able to catch it very quickly and then figure out what, what, it, what it was and fix it. Lastly, for the serving system, there's no tests because we actually don't know. You know, it's production data that we've never seen before coming in. And we don't know what it's supposed to uh, be predicted as. So we think of this as monitoring instead of tests. The basic thing for any kind of serving system is we just want to know, is it up? Is it serving predictions? Are there errors? But for a machine learning system specifically, we also want to know, is the data distribution roughly the same as the training data distribution that we trained on. So an example could be um, you trained on you know, images 256 by 256 pixels, and that's what your users used to be sending you, but then something changed, and now they're sending you, you know, 1024 by 1024. Um, that might have bad effects down the line, so it'd be nice to get alerted as soon as that changes, or potentially you used to get black and white images, and now all of a sudden you're getting color images or grayscale images. So the idea is that you want to catch service and production data regressions. So I want to like leave the full version of the slide up for a second and see if you guys have any questions. Yeah? So to me, it sounds like uh, you, you haven't covered A-B testing. Like you know, this is the offline part. Uh -huh. Yeah. So the, the question or the suggestion for improvement is to also have A-B testing on this diagram. A-B testing refers to uh, being able to serve two different versions of a model, for example, and then collecting some downstream metrics to see which one's better. I would say that's a nice to have. That's not a must have. I would think of all of these as must haves because like something will break uh, at some point and these things should catch it. The A-B testing, you don't have to do it. Um, you could just, let's say, your model just, there's not necessarily a way to improve your model. Your model could just be good enough for the task, and you don't care to test a different version of it. All you want to know is that it's serving the predictions it's supposed to. Uh, but if you would put it on this diagram, I would probably add another arrow next to the serving system and point to like A-B tests. So it's not necessarily that you want to, that's a good question. It really is domain dependent. And uh, this isn't like a decision-making framework. It's more of an alerting framework. It's like you should at least know that the data distribution shifted so that you can use your human intelligence and look into it and decide whether you need to change something. It's not an automated way to say, like, as soon as it changes this much, retrain automatically and deploy it again. Um, it's more of an alert. Yes. Yeah, we have two questions. So first one, the, by just MSQ, for example, do you mean some sort of edge cases? And the second one, this, what 
validation task. Is it additional steps to the traditional validation, or uh, you wait on the same validation? Yeah, I'd call it, maybe I should call it evaluation tests. So that just means, like, presumably, let's say you have a million of examples, and you trained on 900,000 examples, and you kept 100,000 examples as your test set or your validation set. Um, you're not going to test on 100,000 examples every time you change a line of code in your code base. What you are going to test every time you change a line of code is, can I still make a prediction on an image or an audio file, whatever your system's supposed to do? But then every time you change the model, for example, or you just push your code to some kind of continuous integration system, at that point, you want to run on the 100,000 examples and make sure you still have the same accuracy that you're used to. Um, so that's what I mean by validation. I think that was first. How do you think uh, so match your understanding of your is it going to approach to find a fairly comfortable way of production quality code? Uh -huh. How do you think about them like integrating with the sort of workflow and like this is their work all the potential? Yeah, the question is if there's research folks in your team that are not necessarily capable of contributing to a code base that's like this well tested, but they're still useful for generating experiments and stuff like that, where do they fit into this workflow? The answer, I think, is you don't plug them in until they have a model that they think should be productionized. And at that point, you make sure that whatever's in their notebook is in nicely formatted files and the files all have tests, and they confirm, conform to your coding guidelines. Um, so essentially, it's like you don't plug them into this thing until they're ready to contribute a model that actually can go into production. But at that point, you follow all the guidelines here. Does that make sense? But I think people would also potentially see increased productivity if they started following more of these even as they develop models. Um, and that's kind of, I guess, where our lab is coming from. Is uh, It's not necessarily too heavy weight of a code base, but it is like a nice step up from just having a bunch of notebooks where you have a bunch of duplicate code and you just hit train in a notebook to being able to provide a JSON with all your parameters and just typing a shell command that's going to run an experiment. So I'd say if you have like true data scientists living in notebooks, just don't plug them into this until they're ready. But they might see uh, an increase in productivity for themselves if they started doing more kind of good software engineering. Yes? So how about the data scientists store their models in, for example, TensorFlow big data format on the knowledge file? And then you, the, the engineers, they don't have to see their code because they are only importing the model. I'm against that because the like you're saying they store something where both the network structure and the weights are stored in the same binary file. Yes. So the, que the question is what if the workflow that we have is data scientists just produce a model and they just generate a H5 file or something that has the, compu the computational graph and the weights and then the software engineers just load that and then serve predictions. I think that's a bad idea because let's say your deployment is at TensorFlow version one, right? And then TensorFlow 2.0 comes out, your data scientists upgrade, but your software engineers don't. Now they produce a file that maybe is loadable, but produces erroneous predictions. How are you gonna know that that's happening? Um, if the model itself is not tested, then it's just, there's, like if there's a black box part of something, uh, there's going to be some mistake that happens in a black box and no one's going to feel responsible for it and no one's going to be able to find it easily. Whereas if the actual model code was checked into the code base and the requirement version was checked into the code base, then you would know like, oh, this line of code changed and, and uh, this is a new layer that only is in TensorFlow 2.0, so I have to upgrade my requirement. Or alternatively, I upgraded my requirement and now my test failed because the model wasn't trained using this version. Oh, 
that's so the question is the validation set if it's static then potentially in the code base we will just overfit to that validation set because we're driving up improvements in that metric and we'll start diverging from the actual production data so the production data has some distribution the validation has some similar but unique distribution and because we care so much about it we're going to overfit our model to the validation set and start doing a uh, a worse job on the production data. That's a good point. And I think for that reason, I call it a test. I don't think it's not necessarily the objective to have as high accuracy or some metric that you care about as possible on the validation test. It is a requirement to meet some minimum constraint that you have. Or for example, you used to have 80% accuracy on this validation set, and then you upgraded it to TensorFlow 2.0. I like this example. Um, and now you have 75% accuracy. Are you okay with that? Like, why, why did that happen? So this is more for that. It's not to try to drive to like 100%. The distribution thing is only referred to like size, RGB, not mean, medium. Oh, no, absolutely. Whatever you, whatever you care about. So the question is the distribution shifts in the monitoring box. Um, what does that refer to? I refer to anything you care about in your data. So for images, it might be um, the average intensity of the pixels. It might be a whole histogram of intensities. It might be uh, you know, what, whatever, the size of the image, anything like that. All right, I'll keep going. But I'll be bringing the slide back up so you can have more questions. So there's a paper from Google that came out um, 2017 called the Machine Learning Test Score a rubric for machine learning production readiness and technical debt reduction. And it's kind of by the same people that did that machine learning high interest credit card of technical debt. So th that, that group at Google did a couple of papers highlighting problems. And then in 2017, they uh, put out some guidelines for like addressing those problems. So, and there's also a cool document called the rules of machine learning, best practices for machine learning engineering from an engineer at Google. That doesn't go into deep learning at all, but it's just, really good advice for deploying a machine learning system in your organization. So here's a figure from that machine learning test score paper. Um, you know, this is traditional software. You get your code, the code has unit tests, and then it has to integrate with some other code, maybe like other systems send requests to it. So you got integration tests for that. But then if everything passes, then you just deploy your code as a running system, you monitor it, make sure it's up, and you're done, right? Now, machine learning software is more complicated, as we keep saying. So you got the code, which still has the unit tests, and there's an additional step, which is model training. So you can't just take code and deploy it as a running system, because your running system is part code, part data, right? The, the weights are trained from data. So your code goes into the model training code, which then goes into the combined with data goes into the running system. And because of these extra requirements, you have extra tests to do. So you got unit tests, integration tests, which cover the training. Uh, you got machine learning infrastructure tests. So that can refer to, for example, uh, pre-processing features. You got data tests. So you got like uh, data coming in from upstream systems and the schema changes. So now you, you got uh, data in a different format. So you can catch that in just a data test. You have SKU tests, which are basically what we call the data distribution shifts. So that's the difference between training system or training data and production data. And then you got prediction monitoring in the running system, as well as the system monitoring that traditional software has. So kind of like back to our slide, the way we think about it is uh, you got the training system in green, prediction system in pink, serving system in orange, and you got data in gray. So I think what they refer to ML infrastructure tests, I refer to as training system here, model tests, a prediction system. Then the orange is like skew test, data monitoring, prediction monitoring. And then we got gray data tests, which I don't cover in my framework, but they include, and I think it's a good idea. So for data tests, you got seven items. Um, feature expectations are captured in the schema. All features are beneficial. No features cost us too much. Uh, whatever, data pipeline, privacy, I'm not gonna cover all of them. 
model tests, uh, model specs are reviewed and submitted. So that kind of goes to uh, someone's question about what if my data scientists are just producing a black box binary? So that would fail this test, for example, because you can't spec the model at this point. Uh, simpler model is not better. Model quality is sufficient on important data slices. You got ML infrastructure tests. Training is reproducible. The ML pipeline is integration tested. Uh, the model is debuggable. Models are canaried before serving. That's kind of like the AB stuff. And then monitoring tests. You got dependency changes result in notification, uh, which means like, well, data invariants hold for inputs. So if you know your images must be 256 by 256, and all of a sudden they're not, you get alerted, right? Training and serving are not skewed, so you're used to an average intensity of 100 out of 255, but in production all of a sudden you're seeing 200, uh, so that's a skewed distribution. Models are not too stale, so you might have a requirement that every night you train a new model and the running system has that nightly build, but at some point something breaks and it has a, a model that's two days old, so you get notified about that. So anyway, they came out with this rubric, and then they decided, or they, they, they formed a, uh, a way to score it. So you get half a point for like a manual process that enforces that rubric item, and some documentation around it. And you get a full point if it's fully automated. You sum scores within each of the four sections, and then you take the minimum of all four sections. So it's like your production system is only as good as the weakest link in it. That's the idea. Um, and then if you get zero points, so there's like no tests at all, then it's more of a research project than a productionized system. If you have uh, one or less points, then, or sorry, less than one point, then, you know, it's not totally, uh, you didn't, you thought about something, but it's, you probably have some serious holes. If it's between one and two points, then you gotta spend more time on it, but you're on the right track. Anyway, and if you have over five, then that's exceptional. That's like world class. So then they went and talked to 36 different teams that have a machine learning system in production at Google. Um, and they give the average scores across all these rubric items. And you can see that it's never, on average, across these 36 teams, more than one, right? And it's on average 0.5. So even at Google, which has been doing this for like decades, people aren't, people are still figuring it out. And a lot of process is still manual, which gives you that 0.5 point. Um, and I, th they actually don't report the full rubric scores for Google, but you know from this they must be pretty low, um, according to their own, you know their own summation. So I think it's an aspirational goal. It was just published in 2017. Don't feel bad if like not everything's fully tested, but it is a good thing to aspire to. So now I want to go back, and uh, I guess do you guys have any questions about this? So um, I'll keep going. So now we get to the actual kind of infrastructure and tooling for deployment. And the first decision you got to make is like, where are you deploying? Are you deploying a web server into the cloud? Are you deploying on some embedded device or even a physical device on a car or something? Are you deploying to a mobile device? That's, there's no guidance there. That's just what you got in your business. Um, so what are some tools for continuous integration and testing? So the, there's unit integration test, continuous integration. So unit integration test refers to test for individual module functionality and for the whole system. So continuous integration refers to the idea that every time you push code to the repository that your team shares, you run a bunch of tests and you don't ever deploy anything until all the tests pass. So there's software as a service for continuous integration um, like CircleCI, Travis, Jenkins, or uh, BuildKite. And then there's an important concept of containerization when it comes to testing. Because you're running on usually someone else's infrastructure, you have to package up all of your system dependencies and versions into something that they can take and test. And uh, Docker has emerged as the standard solution for this. It's a kind of self-enclosed environment for running the tests that's very lightweight, very fast to, to use. So 
for CI, this is what we're talking about again. You've got functionality tests, validation tests, and probably training system tests. Um, the functionality tests are a no-brainer. They can run in you know, less than five minutes. The validation tests are a little harder. They might take you know, up to an hour. The training system tests, you're probably not going to want to run on a software as a service because it might require a GPU, for example. Um, and so for that, you probably just want to set something up on your own hardware or your own cloud you know, infrastructure. That's almost like just a nightly job that just goes through the whole training pipeline and makes sure that it completes. This is the part of the ML test score that I think CI and uh, testing can address. We can test the input features. We can test that the model have actual specs that pass. Um, and one of the commonly used ones, software as a service, is Circle CI or Travis, stuff like that. Um, they integrate with your repository. So let's say your repository is in GitHub. You can set up Circle CI to kind of hook into your GitHub such that every time you push to GitHub, it kicks off a continuous integration job and then gives you like a nice little flag that says build passing or something. This is actually what we're going to do in the lab. And then you define the job as potentially commands in the Docker container. Um, and then Circle CI or Travis or whatever you use is going to store the results of running the tests for your later review. So you can actually go back. And for every single commit to the code base, you can see whether tests passed and stuff like that. Now, the problem is these solutions don't have GPUs. Um, you can, yeah, so it's not good for training tests. Circle CI has a free plan, which is what we use in lab because it's free. There's also uh, kind of bring your own hardware versions of this. So there's still software as a service for hooking up to GitHub and having like a pipeline of tests, storing the results somewhere. But the actual tests are run on your own hardware. And that doesn't mean hardware you own, but it's just hardware that you can provision in the cloud and then connect to the service. So Jenkins is more of an old school one. And it's all, you can install it on your own premises. And uh, it's just on your own hardware. BuildKite is kind of a nicer thing that a lot of people started using recently that just has this idea of a BuildKite agent. It can run on your own hardware, or it can run in the cloud. It can run in the Kubernetes cluster. There's all these nice interfaces. But the idea is that when you push code, it notifies BuildKite. BuildKite essentially puts a job on the queue. And then it's up to you to start agents to pull jobs from the queue and actually run the tests. And when they finish the tests, they upload the results to BuildKite. So BuildKite is kind of like the repository of all the results. And this can be a good option for the nightly training test because you can just, um, for example, you can be using BuildKite for your continuous integration that runs every time you push code. And that can run just in the cloud. But you can also use BuildKite to, you can run agents on your own hardware and they pull jobs that are just the nightly training jobs. So you can also have like automatically repeating jobs on BuildKite, just like cron jobs on Linux. You can set up a little config file that just says every night kick off this job. So this is uh, what I've heard a lot of people use is BuildKite recently. So it's super flexible. And you, you have these notions of pipelines. So for example, you might want to pass a certain test before you even start in another one. And if this one doesn't pass, you don't start the other one. So there's all kinds of pipelines you can hook up. So now I want to cover Docker. But before proceeding, I just kind of want to understand, I want to cover Docker in more detail. So let's understand a little better. So what's the difference between a Docker container and a virtual machine? What is the big deal about Docker files when people say, like, oh, it's a Docker image layer. What does that mean? Um, what is Docker Hub? What's like the overall ecosystem around Docker? People keep talking about Kubernetes and container orchestration, stuff like that. What does that mean? Um, so let's start with Docker. <clears throat> so this is the traditional virtual machine. So a virtual machine runs on hardware, which, so you got your server, that's like the physical hardware. You got the host OS, so let's say that's Linux of some sort. Then you got the hypervisor. And this is kind of like an interface 
that's able to hook in more directly to the underlying hardware, bypassing some of the operating system. And then on top of that, you are running a program called the virtual machine. And the virtual machine actually has its own operating system, which could be, for example, Windows. And then on top of the Windows, it has all the binaries and libraries that you need for your thing. And then finally, on top of that, you have your app code. So for example, I'm running a virtual machine that is Linux, and it has all the Linux kernel, all that stuff. Then it has all the libraries like CUDA, CUDA libraries, everything I need, and then you know Python. And then I finally have my system, and then I'm running that huge virtual machine on a Windows operating system. So I'm able to essentially develop in Ubuntu, but on Windows. That's the standard virtual machine thing. Now what a container is, and we'll just say Docker from now on, but we mean a container, um, is that you still have the hardware, you still have the operating system, but then on top of it you have this Docker engine. And because the Docker engine is kind of smarter about um, what it needs, the container doesn't have to package up the operating system. It can just package up the binaries and libraries that you need and then your actual application code. So you kind of remove the guest operating system. And because you remove the guest operating system, um, the container is much more lightweight. And I mean that both in file size and also in startup time. So it doesn't have to load all the operating system and execute all that code. It just hooks in directly to the Docker engine and it just has uh, the libraries. Yeah, so the question is, does this Docker stuff support GPUs? No, no, the, the VM example. Oh, the VM example? Yeah. Um, yeah, certainly there's virtual machines that can pass through GPU stuff. Support consumer-level GPUs? Consumer-level GPUs. I believe so. I, I think I used to run a Windows virtual machine on my Mac that was able to use my Mac GPU. Uh, for CUDA specifically, I guess I haven't personally like done that, but I would imagine that's still true. Do you guys know? Uh, not on the latest OSX. Uh, is that a problem with the drive you still? Okay. So yeah, maybe the question, the answer is I'm not sure. Do um, you guys have any other questions? So, because the Docker container is so much lighter weight than uh, the virtual machine it has led to really heavy use of it. So the same, the same kernel, the same kind of Docker engine can support a container that has a Java stack with like basically all the Debian, uh, which is a Linux distribution, libraries and packages, and then Java on top of that, and then the Tomcat Java server on top of that. But it can also support all the Ubuntu libraries with a MySQL and PHP stack on top of it, or it can support a very lightweight Linux distribution called Alpine, which has like almost no libraries or anything like that, and then just has a static uh, binary, so that like just some C code that just links to like all the libraries are static. Um, so it has no dependencies on OS stuff. For that reason, you can just run it on like bare bones Linux. And because it's so easy to do that, you can essentially spin up a container for every discrete task, right? So for example, you might be developing a web application and you might want four containers. One container for the web server, let's say it's like just PHP, um, keep it simple. One container for the database, like MySQL. One container for the worker queue, uh, which like th this is when some kind of heavy request gets made to the web server, it doesn't execute it synchronously. It puts it on the job queue so that someone else can do it. And then one container for the worker that's going to be pulling from the queue and then doing the jobs, putting them back into the database. They can all interoperate. They can talk to each other. Um, they're all nicely provisioned. Like I say, I want MySQL version 1.11 or whatever. It doesn't affect the version of my web server. It can use Ubuntu while my web server uses Windows. And so it's all very nice um, and still lightweight. The Docker file is a format for writing, for specifying what goes into a Docker container. So I should be more precise about the language. So a Docker file is the specification of a Docker image. And then a Docker image, when executed, becomes a running Docker container. 
So an image specifies the container, and then the Docker file is the, is the format of the image. So the Docker file has this layered uh, structure, and it does like really aggressive caching of the layers. So what that means is, I don't know if you can see, um, but hopefully you can. The top line here says, you know, use an official Python runtime as the base image. And it says from Python 2.7 slim. So that's a Docker image that someone else specified. Potentially the Python like official repository specified it. And it has all the things you need to run Python and nothing else, right? Um, maybe based on some kind of basic Linux. Then you say, OK, within that Docker image, I'm going to want my work directory, like the code that I actually want to run. I'm going to, live, I'm going to have it live in the slash app directory. I'm going to add everything that is in my current local directory on my local computer, where I'm running this Docker build command. I'm going to add all of the files there to the Docker image under slash app. Then I'm going to run pip install to install all the requirements I'm going to need for my Python application. Then I'm going to expose port 80 in this Docker container uh, to the world outside of it. And, uh, and then at the end, I'm going to run a command called python app.py. So this is going to launch the Python web server, and it'll start listening on port 80. Port 80 is connected to my local port 80, which could be connected to the internet. And there you go. I have a web server um, running in a Docker on my computer. So down here, you might say, you might see something like, OK, Docker run this image. It'll say, unable to find image you know, Gordon slash get started locally. I'm going to pull from Docker Hub. I'm going to look for an image called Docker get, uh, Gordon get started. And it'll pull, let's say, this Docker file right here. And because the Docker file specifies essentially other images as layers, it'll say, OK, the first thing I have to do is pull this Python 2.7 slim layer. But first, before pulling it from the internet, I'm going to check on my local cache and see if I already have it. And if I already have it, I'll say already exists, done, I'm loaded it. And so essentially, as you start working with Docker, um, very quickly, like building a new image is pretty much instant because nothing changes. Like the OS is the same, the library is the same, only your application code changed. And so the only thing that Docker has to do is just change your application code, which can just take seconds. So there's the virtual machine where you like really have to spend minutes like packaging up everything into a virtual machine every single time. So because this Docker file format is nice, yep? Is this thing marked back, or is there a substitution to back? It's not. It's its, its own language. Um, you can run bash commands as part of your Docker file. So when it says run, pip install, whatever, like that can be anything else. It could be run, you know, cat this file, pipe it into some other file, and you can use all the nice Unix stuff. So because this Docker file is a good format and it's so easy to create images and, and uh, contribute them to Docker Hub, a strong ecosystem has quickly formed uh, around this stuff. So like for anything you might want to do, images are pretty easy to find. And then once you find an image that's basically almost what you want, it's very easy for you to just modify it a tiny bit uh, just by like saying from Python 3.6, add you know, Postgres, and then run this you know, Python interface to Postgres. You name it, you know, Sergey K slash Python Postgres, and then you Docker push it to the Docker Hub. Now, if someone else wants to come along and they need Python and Postgres, they can search Docker Hub and then just start from that. So, and then, you know, public images are one thing, and that's nice, but you can also easily have private images. Docker is actually, I would say, from the price to benefit ratio, it's like definitely the highest or lowest because we like at our company, you know, we pay almost nothing for Docker Hub, but we have like you know thousands or hundreds of thousands of private Docker images. It's used you know multiple times per day every time you like circle, every time you do continuous integration or deploy. Um, so it's very cheap, so don't be afraid of it, and it, it's really taken off, right? So this is Docker Hub number of pulls. So for five years ago, there was like 1 million pools. And then probably last year, there were like 20 million pools. So 20 billion pools, sorry. Do you guys have any questions or comments about Docker? Is there any ongoing effort having to do a user support for, for Docker-based 
Uh, of what kind of support? Oh, I see. Um, I don't know. Yeah, not sure. I, you probably wouldn't want it, because the whole point is to treat it as code, essentially. Like, you specify your dependencies as code that can be executed by Docker. Whereas, if you put a GUI into it, oh, sorry, the question was, is there a GUI for Docker files? And I don't think, I'm not sure if there is, but I, it doesn't seem like a good idea, because you want to be able to specify your Docker image programmatically via the Docker file. Yeah, so Docker can run, yeah, it can interface with graphics things. So the question was, I'm not totally sure what the question is, but I just want to say that Docker is able to interface with graphics libraries. And there's NVIDIA Docker, which is able to interface with CUDA-enabled NVIDIA cards. Um, so yeah, I should say that, actually. Docker, as is, is not able to use CUDA GPUs. But NVIDIA Docker is able to use NVIDIA GPUs. Well, you can say, like, from this image, and then add this image, add this image. So it, it, it is a layer. But yeah, it, I don't know what it would mean to be branching. Anyway, let's keep going. This is a con container orchestration. So Docker specifies containers. Containers are lightweight ways to package up libraries and app code with, and a foundational OS without actually including the OS. And because it's so easy to package up, you might have containers that you have one container for your application code, one container for your database, one container for your machine learning code, one container for your like, image processing work. So the, the question becomes, how do I actually deploy all these containers in a way that's sane? And there's a number of solutions to it. Um, Mesos was probably the first one, actually came out of Berkeley as well, uh, popularized at Twitter, and now it's its own startup called Mesosphere. Then you got Docker Swarm as a, I think, the Docker people solution. Then you have Elastic Container, or what is it called? ECS Fargate from AWS. You have a startup called Marathon. But the clear winner seems to be Kubernetes, which is an open source project that came out of Google. And uh, essentially, the, the task it's solving is distributing containers onto underlying hardware, which can be virtualized or it could actually be bare metal. <laughs> Kubernetes is the open source winner. Uh, the different cloud providers have their own kind of brand name offerings. The Google one is probably called Kubernetes, but the Amazon one is called Fargate um, or something else. They, they, you know, they're always, this is in flux right now. So, Kubernetes specifically, there's a little graphic on the left. It says an ocean of user containers. It all goes into the cloud Kubernetes master and then comes out neatly packaged onto the hardware that you have. You guys have any questions about that? I think, yeah? Can you comment on OpenShift? Do you have any references? I don't, I don't know much about it. The question was, can I comment on OpenShift? And I don't know much about it. Why do you need Kubernetes? You don't need Kubernetes. You might need Kubernetes if you kind of go all in on containerization and all, every part of your multi-component app is its own container. And then the question is, OK, I own some hardware, or I, I'm paying for some virtual hardware, and I have all these containers. I could put a container per machine. But maybe that's not the optimal way to use those resources. Um, so what I can do is I can just tell some interface layer that we call Kubernetes. It's like, hey, here's all the containers I have. Here's how much of each one I want. And here's the hardware I have. Please figure out how to allocate everything correctly. So that's the situation in which you need it. We don't need it as like, 
Yeah, I don't, I, I don't think we need it as deep learning developers. We do need Docker potentially to package up our dependencies, but we don't necessarily need Kubernetes unless we're doing something more complicated interfacing with other services. So the next thing I want to talk about is deploying to the web. Um, so the common, the common thing you hear is a REST API. So it essentially means serving predictions of your model in response to kind of canonically formatted HTTP requests. So there's a language around it like get, put, delete, post, stuff like that. That's what's commonly known as REST. The web server is essentially the way to interface with HTTP requests that are formatted like that. Uh, we don't need to reinvent that technology. We just use a web server. But then what the web server has to do is, is call the prediction system. So essentially, we think of it as the web server wrapping our prediction system such that it's an interface to HTTP requests. The options for us are basically deploying this code to virtual machines, and then we can scale by just adding more virtual machines. We can deploy this code as containers, and then we can scale with maybe orchestration like Kubernetes. Um, or we can deploy code as a serverless function, which means it's kind of an abstraction that's even one step beyond Docker, um, which like if we can package our code in a way that works with Google Cloud Platform functions or Amazon Lambda functions, then we potentially don't even need to think about servers at all. They take care of it for us. So this is the prediction system and the serving system. It's kind of what we're talking about here. The part of the ML test score um, are probably, can we canary models before we serve them? Uh, can, we, can we easily roll back when we change our model? Canarying refers to uh, potentially putting a model in production for a small subset of our traffic such that we can identify problems before all the users see our problem at, at once. So I have a little meme um, slide here, which you know the first thing you might think is, all right, we have our code. We just deploy it to our own servers. And that's not an option uh, because we don't, we don't want to manage our own hardware. So the next thing is deploy code to cloud instances. So the idea there is we have our code. We kind of push it onto virtual machines like EC2 instances or uh, Google Cloud Platform you know, web in, uh, sorry, computer instances. There's many of them because we want to be able to scale to a lot of requests. And each one can only handle some amount of requests per second. And so we put all of them behind what's known as a load balancer, which is like a very simple HTTP interface that the user hits. So the user hits an IP. The load balancer says, OK, I have these five instances. Um, I'm going to randomly send this request to, to one of the instances. And the other thing Load Balancer does is it pings the instances to make sure they're up and healthy. And if they're all super busy, it can actually add more instances via auto-scaling. Auto so the thing here is that we have to provision each instance with all the dependencies in the app code. The number of instances we can either set manually. We can say, like, well, we're running three today, and then Oh, like the you know too many requests per minute. Let's add three more, or we can set up rules for auto scaling, <laughs> and the load balancer sends us traffic. So the cons of this approach are uh, like we're not using Docker here, so we're provisioning these instances ourselves with some other thing like Chef or whatever, and that can be brittle. Um, like yeah, and then let's say we start up three of them, but then our requests really taper down. So most of them are just sitting idle. And so we're paying for them, but we're not actually needing them. Uh, auto scaling can help here, scale down, scale up, but it has its own downsides. So the next thing is like, well, you know, this Docker thing seems really good. Can we just deploy Docker containers to cloud instances? And yes, you can. Um, the app code and dependencies, you package it up as a Docker container, and then you send the Docker container to something, maybe using Kubernetes, maybe not. Uh, but essentially, you have some kind of orchestrator like AWS Fargate, and you say, here's the container I want you to be able to serve. Um, here's maybe a load balancing rule. But the thing is, you're still paying for the servers. So it's like the interface has moved up a little bit in terms of the code, 
but it hasn't really moved in terms of what you're paying for. You're still paying for instances per hour of use. And so that still means that if you're not getting a lot of, up, a lot of requests, but you're paying for uptime, you're just kind of wasting your money. So the next thing, which you know, kind of jokingly is maybe the best thing, but maybe also is like too much of a good idea, is to deploy serverless functions. And so there, the idea is like, okay, we have some code and some weights and stuff. If we can package it up in a format that is just literally like a zip file with some piece of code that's the entry point, then all the major cloud providers like AWS, Google, or Microsoft Azure, they have these things called serverless functions that basically manage everything for you, right? So if you just give them something that they can work with, then they can scale it up to like 10,000 plus requests per second. They will only charge you per second of compute time, so they don't charge you for uptime because there's no instance that's actually up. Um, there's only compute time of how you know, the users are accessing your function. I think this is a good thing for machine learning models because usually they're bursty. Um, so it's kind of nice to uh, pay for compute time. And then the other reason is, you know, lowers your DevOps load because your servers can't go down if you don't own any servers. <laughs> so the cons are you got to like really work with these really severe constraints. So your entire deployment package has to fit within 500 megabytes. It has to finish executing in, in less than, I think now it's actually 30 minutes for Lambda. Um, and it has to use less than three gigabytes of memory total. So, and, and of course there's no GPUs here, so it's only CPUs. Um, and then the nice things that you can do are, you can canary, so you can like, essentially the, the serverless function interface makes it possible for you to say, okay, I want 10% of the traffic to go to this version of the function, 90% to this old version of the function, and then if I start seeing uh, errors here, I'll just scale it back down to zero. And then you can also easily roll back. You can just say, you know, like literally in the command line, I can just say AWS Lambda deploy, you know, version 13, um, and it'll instantly send all traffic to the old function. So it's quite nice. And we're actually gonna do this in the lab uh, so that you're at least able to do it yourself later. I'm not fully signing off on this as the best solution. I think it makes sense for some, uh, some settings and it doesn't make sense for other settings. I have a question, so. If your application is latency sensitive, is Lambda a good approach? So Lambda has another downside that I probably didn't list, which is the startup time. So the way, like there actually are instances running your code, right, somewhere, it's not magic. You, they just hide them from you. And because they hide them from you, you don't know how many are up at any given time. So what happens is, let's say you go from zero requests all the way to 10,000 requests per second. Amazon or Google has, have to now provision enough you know, instances to actually be able to serve those 10,000 requests per second, and they just can't do it instantly. So it'll take them maybe 30 seconds or maybe even a couple of minutes to scale out to that volume. Um, if it's super important to you that you're able to just handle that load at any given time, then you just have, there's no other solution than to pay for uptime of all these servers that you control yourself that are just mostly sitting idle, but if there's a spike in requests, they're able to handle it. There is one thing you can do with Lambda functions, which is called uh, uh, keeping them warm, which is basically like making requests all the time so that they stay kind of loaded in the Amazon or Google cache so that it's ready to like scale out to more requests. So, yeah. So why would you want to deploy a machine learning model on serverless compared to a CPU? Because, mo so the question is, why are we even talking about CPU only deployment of machine learning models? For training, GPUs are indispensable because you want to send batches of examples through the network and that just takes memory and compute. And you also want to do the backwards pass, which is where most of the computation happens, like 
percent of the computation. Um, in production, you only do the forward pass, which can be pretty easy. And then also, you're serving one prediction at a time. So you don't have a batch of things to predict on usually. You just, I mean, it kind of depends on what the application is once again. But most things I can imagine, you kind of get in single requests, like classify this image, classify this part of, uh, classify this sentence, classify this audio file, right? And so for that reason, the memory requirements actually aren't that big. And the computer requirements actually aren't that big either. Like you can send, even through a complicated ConvNet, a single image on a CPU in a fraction of a second. So for that reason, I think CPU-based deployment makes a lot of sense for most, for a lot of things. Not going to say that it's the right thing for everything, but I, you'd be surprised that just because you need a GPU to train does not necessarily mean you need a GPU to serve. Yep? So you touched upon uh, serving sample by sample. Uh, can you comment further on uh, other cases where you, you might have uh, to serve batches? You might have to serve batches if you're doing some kind of you have a running system that, let's say, nightly classifies all the images that your users uploaded during that day. So it's like the prediction is not immediately served to the user, but it's just stored in some data lake or, or even database for use by downstream systems later on. Um, and in that case, you are doing batch processing. Um, I, have I have less to say about that, but there's yeah, there's, um, I would probably not have that be a web server because it doesn't need to have that HTTP interface. It can just be part of your kind of compute infrastructure. And there's things that cloud providers have like AWS batch functions that kind of nicely hook up to uh, queues of jobs and execute you know, on batches of them. But I don't, I don't have slides about that. So model serving is something that you might hear when you read like TensorFlow docs or just about machine learning deployment. And so what that usually means is like a, some kind of web deployment option or API deployment option that's specialized specifically for machine learning models. So TensorFlow serving is one that you've probably heard about. There's also a model server for MXNet. And there's um, open source stuff like this, uh, this thing called Clipper from Berkeley Rise Lab. And then there's software as a service solutions. One of them that I know is Algorithmia. So TensorFlow serving is essentially just able to serve specifically TensorFlow model predictions at very high throughput. And it's used by Google. Like if you use Google Cloud ML engine, it's probably using some version of TensorFlow serving under the hood to be like really efficient about the way it's using um, the resources. And this one might be using GPUs to make predictions. So there are models, certainly, that don't fit on. Like, it doesn't make sense to serve predictions with CPUs. You need GPUs. For that reason, you might want to have these optimized TensorFlow serving type libraries. But my take is that it's probably overkill unless you can explain to yourself why you need it. So I would first try serving stuff on CPU. And then if that's too slow or you understand that you actually have to serve batches, or you understand you actually need the GPU, at that point, I would look into TensorFlow serving. But my take is that you probably don't need it. Uh, same thing for MXNet model server. You got model archive, model serving cluster, load balancer. So it's essentially like the same kind of thing that I've presented, except specifically for a given framework. And this is part of SageMaker, which is their all-in-one machine learning offering from yesterday. So there's also a thing called Clipper, which I think is kind of cool here at Berkeley. It's an open source model serving using REST uh, with everything packaged up using Docker. And it has some like, nice to haves on top of the basics that I covered. So the basics that I covered is like load balancing and just like being able to version stuff and serve predictions. But there's some nice to haves like state of the art bandit and ensemble methods to intelligently select and combine predictions. So what that means is you might have multiple models in production and every input goes through all of them. And then you have something on top of it, select like essentially uh, ensembling the prediction outputs and maybe given like the majority vote or doing something smarter about it, combining the different predictions. And uh, my take once again is 
uh, unless you really think, like, if you can explain to yourself exactly why it's useful to you, then it's useful to you. But mostly, you probably just want to do CPU inference. Um, and then there's startups. One of them is Algorithmia. OK, you train a TensorFlow model or a PyTorch model. You git push it into the Algorithmia AI layer. It makes your model ready for scale. And then it'll manage all the hardware and then make your model available via an HTTP API, REST API. So my take is that this is essentially like packaging up a couple of things like Lambda and a load balancer. I haven't tried it personally. It might be really good. It might be overkill. You might just be able to do it yourself. My takeaway is that if you are doing CPU inference, then you can just try to go serverless. If, that, if you can't make that work, then just do the simple thing that people have been doing for years. Just put a load balancer and actually have some instances running your code. The dream that people have is just, can we deploy Docker containers as easily as we can deploy Lambda? So essentially, I just package up a Docker container. I tell Amazon to just serve it, and it just does a great job. We're not there yet, but we probably will be in the next couple of years. Uh, but the next best thing today is either Lambda or Docker just deployed on your own instances, you potentially using something like Fargate. And then if you are using GPU inference, then things like TensorFlow serving probably make sense, or maybe an open source version of something like that, like Clipper, because what they can do is they can, if let's say you get uh, 10 requests per second, maybe you can package them up into a batch of size 10, push it through the GPU, then return it correctly to all the callers. Okay, you guys have any questions about web deployment? How can we estimate the cost of our entire machine learning solution? <laughs> Including the training and the, like the data and the training, I think it becomes very hard because you, how many experiments are you going to need to run? How much data are you running on? It's just a very hard question to answer. When it comes to deploying the, the model, it is an easier thing to put a price on because let's say you are using Lambda. So the price of Lambda is, let's say, 0 0.03 cents per uh, second of execution. And you can just run it, see how many requests per day you get, see the average runtime, multiply them, multiply them by the cost, and that's your cost per day. So there it becomes easier to kind of prognosticate and see, like, well, what if we double our user base? So how much are we going to spend? Um, or if you're paying for, for your own instances, they usually have an hourly rate. It's like, I know I'm paying let's say $2 for this P2 uh, instance, and I'm serving predictions with GPUs, then I'm using $24 a day, and I need 10 of them up, so that's $240 a day, and so on. But for the overall system, I think it's a very hard question to answer. The question is, is it common to learn weights with something like TensorFlow, but then use, don't, like, not use TensorFlow to actually serve the predictions, just like do NumPy array multiplication of the weights with the input? I don't think it's common. Uh, you can use TensorFlow on CPU. There's no reason. Yeah, I, I understand that you could implement it yourself with NumPy, but there's also no reason in my mind to not just use TensorFlow. Like TensorFlow works perfectly fine on CPU. So you just use TensorFlow. It loads its own weights. It processes on CPU. If you're trying to avoid like, the dependency on TensorFlow, then I would question whether you need to. It, maybe we have a misunderstanding, so let's just take it offline. So the next thing I want to talk about is monitoring. So alerts at downtime, errors, distribution shifts, a uh, bunch of monitoring tests. So the basic monitoring that you want to cover is just like how long does each execution of your request, like when you answer a user request, how long does it take to execute? Um, how much memory did you use in, in answering it? How many invocations per second are you getting? And then you probably want to set up alarms for when things go wrong. So maybe your error rate is like above 1% per minute. That sends you an email and, and says something's wrong. And then you also want to be able to look at records historically, like 
what was my, how many requests per second was I answering last month? So all cloud providers have like, okay, monitoring solutions. Uh, we'll get you basically set up. And then the thing to understand that's kind of cool is like anything you can log, you can also have a, uh, a, a metric for. So for example, data distributions, do I have a slide on this? You know, we'll explore it in lab. But like for data distribution, your, uh, you know, your model code, it loads the image, it makes the prediction, and then it can just like log the, some statistic about the image that you care about and then some statistic about the prediction. So for example, the confidence of the prediction. So you can say like, oh, I'm 0.8% confident on an image with intensity 0.7. And you just log those things. And then in your monitoring solution, you can extract those numbers from the logs. And you can have a nice graph for those. And you can set a metric alarm for them. So this is quite cool. That's all I have to say about monitoring. Someone in Slack yesterday said there's a cool new startup that focuses on monitoring for machine learning models specifically. What was that? It's in Slack. I forget the name. Um, yeah, that's it. So I haven't looked into it, but maybe it'll fill that question mark that I have in that thing. So one thing I want to quickly mention is an interchange format. This kind of goes to um, your question before about can we train weights with TensorFlow and then serve them just with NumPy? Um, a more general question is like, can we train weights with TensorFlow and then serve them with something other than TensorFlow? And the answer is definitely. Uh, and people have come together, like Microsoft, Facebook, and Amazon, I think, came together and formulated this format for specifically deep learning models called Onyx, Open Neural Network Exchange. And the dream that they had is to be able to just mix frameworks. So maybe train in PyTorch, serve predictions in MXNet, or train in CAFE, serve predictions in PyTorch, whatever you want. It supports CAFE2, Chainer, Cognitive Toolkit, MXNet, PyTorch, something called Paddle Paddle. I have no idea what that is. Um, it all, oh, what is it? Oh, OK. It's probably super cool. I don't mean to denigrate it. So converters. It can also convert you know, the, your trained model to, for example, a MATLAB format, or a TensorFlow format, or potentially a core ML format, which is a mobile thing. And then it can also have like, optimized runtimes, like as optimized NVIDIA runtime, maybe Qualcomm dev embedded devices, stuff like that. So I, I think it's pretty cool. I think I, I don't have personal experience with it. Hardware, mobile. Um, is the next thing to cover. So the problems when it comes to deploying on something other than like a nice machine is that maybe it doesn't have enough memory or maybe it has a low power processor so it's actually very slow. Um, or maybe it'll eat up your battery so it's kind of like expensive to compute on this device. So often what people do is they reduce the network size or use some kind of tricks or potentially quantize the weights to deal with these problems. And just in terms of like nuts and bolts, there are mobile versions of frameworks like TensorFlow Mobile and TensorFlow Lite. But the problem you might face is that they have less features than full TensorFlow. And so you potentially have to adjust your network architecture to make it work with, with uh, mobile version. So the first thing I want to talk about is just methods for compression of, of networks. So the idea that you might have is like, well, I've trained a network with a million parameters. But do I actually need that million of parameters to serve predictions? The answer is often no. You just need some subset of the parameters. And there's methods for doing that. So you can remove correlated weights. You can add certain sparsity constraints in the training such that less things are kind of used, even though like, they could be used, but the network is incentivized not to use them as it learns. You can introduce cool structure to convolutional filters that make them a lot lighter weight. And that's coming up on the next slide. You can also do something called knowledge, knowledge distillation, which essentially means you train a deep network on your data, and then you train a shallow network on the predictions of the deep network. So essentially, like the data has a certain complicated you know, data distribution manifold that a deep network is better able to infer and kind of match itself to it. But as we saw in Peter's review lecture on Friday, for those of you who were there, you can represent any function at all in just a one-layer network, one hidden layer, so two layers total. 
So you, there is a shallow network of sufficient width that's able to represent like any problem at all. So the question is, the problem is it's hard to train because like, like anything is possible and so it's very hard to actually match it to the data. A deep net, not everything is possible. It's very constrained by the actual structure of the network. And if the structure of the network matches the structure of the data, it's very good at learning. That's kind of why convolutional networks work so well for images and audio stuff. Um, but once you've trained it, then can you train a shallow network to predict the deep network? And there are surveys about this. The one thing I want to quickly cover is a paper from, I think, Google called MobileNet. And basically, we have a, like, when you think about conceptually what a three by three convolution is, is you got um, an output pixel sees three input pixels, right? And then all of the channels. So if you have like an RBG image, it's three channels. The convolutional filter will see three pixels around it. Well, nine pixels around it, but let's just say one slice. And then it'll see all of the channels. So all of the channels are connected across each other. But a one by one convolution only sees one pixel across all the channels. And then like an inception uh, network, what it does is it has a one by one convolution and then a three by three convolution and then a one by one convolution. And the effect of, like, the effect of it is to essentially reduce the number of cross channel connections because the one by one convolution reduces the channel dimension down then the three by three convolution is, is faster because it doesn't have to connect so many channels. And then you expand it back up to the original channel dimension. Now mobile net kind of takes this one step further, which has this idea of a depth wise convolution. So that means spatially, you know, the output pixel is connected to all the pixels around it, but a given channel of an output is only connected to that same channel of the input. And so if you do that first, and then a one by one convolution that's connected channel wise, then that's like way more efficient than the original three by three convolution. So, and it has a nice effect that you can kind of like, there's a knob for you to twist. Um, and so what they did is they trained a bunch of mobile nets. They look at the image net top 1% accuracy. And then this is MACs, I kind of forget what that stands for, but it's, I think it's the number of um, either parameters or computation uh, like, flops of computation that you would need to do. And mobile net has like this nice kind of scaling where the accuracy is pretty high, but you can really decrease the number of parameters and stuff that it, that it needs. What so for the review stuff each uh, point shows? What's that? The review stuff is like Alex meant what has larger. Oh, the, the size of the actual uh, image? You know, what it probably is is uh, the size of the points corresponds to the number of parameters. And then the placing of the points in this graph on the x-axis corresponds to the number of computational operations uh, that it does. But yeah, there's a link on the slide that you guys can check out. Um, the basic idea is that it's possible to obtain the same accuracy on a given problem with way less parameters if you're kind of smart about certain structure in your network. So when you're deploying to hardware or mobile, TensorFlow gives you two options. Uh, one of them is called TensorFlow Lite, and then one of them is called TensorFlow Mobile. That's TensorFlow Mobile is like an older solution. TensorFlow Lite is a more recent solution. Um, and both of them have a limited set of operators. So if you use some kind of you know, unique types of layers, you might find that you can't have your network work on TensorFlow Lite. Um, I don't have personal experience with it, but anecdotally talking with people, it seems like people usually have trouble taking a network they trained on GPU and then getting it to work on the phone. Then there's also abstractions for uh, machine learning models on the iPhone and the Android devices. And the names are CoreML for Apple and MLKit for, um, for Google. And it's confusing because the Apple augmented reality thing is called AR kit. And then the Google one is called like, I forget what it's called, but it's, it's like they switch, out, switch around. Um, what's it called? Yeah, probably. I don't know. 
Um, so, yeah, imp you know, important to know that they exist. Uh, I don't have much <coughs> advice here to give, but there's a startup called Fritz that's supposed to take your model and then make it work with either Core ML or MLKit, which could be nice because then you could hit up both Android and iPhone. And then for embedded devices, NVIDIA output, you know, NVIDIA Jetson, for example, is a specific like low power uh, GPU. And they have optimized runtimes called Tensor RT that essentially you give it your network that you trained using something. And then if you can make it work on Tensor RT, then you know it can be optimized for NVIDIA uh, embedded devices. So the other big thing in, I guess, deploying on embedded devices is reduced precision computation. So I talked briefly yesterday about float 16 versus float 32. So basically, you know, the idea is that if you can train your network using float 16 uh, instead of float 32, 16-bit 16 precision float point, fl floating point numbers versus 32-bit precision, then it'll probably work just as well, but it'll use way less memory and be faster for that reason. And GPUs today, like the new Turing architecture, is really aimed at supporting that 16-bit computation. For the embedded device, it's also super nice because it just uses less memory, and so um, bigger networks can fit onto the same device if it's in 16-bit versus 32-bit. So that's, I don't have much to say about embedded devices. I don't have personal experience, unfortunately. I know some of you have deployment targets that are embedded. And I think the Slack is a great place to trade notes about what worked for you and what didn't. Um, and I'd be interested and curious to hear it as well. Yeah? Um, can you just elaborate on what you mean by if your network can work on uh, Tensor RT? I probably actually cannot elaborate okay. too much on it. <laughs> but yeah, sorry. So let's say, let's forget about embedded. Let's say you're just training stuff for, you're going to run stuff on your own PC or deploy it as a web thing. Um, so should you be doing training in 32-bit or 16-bit precision? So the, the, it's almost, so there's a cool blog post that I've seen that even talks about 8-bit precision. Um, and the idea is that you can almost think, so let's think about dropout. So dropout randomly turns off some of the weights or sets them to zero. Um, and then the idea is that the network still works even though every time computation goes through it, it uses a slightly different path and they essentially inject noise into the system. But it might actually be helpful because the network learns to deal with it, right? And so this blog post was making the analogy to reduced precision computation where is the difference between you know, 0 0.0001 and 0 0.0001, the, like if you start kind of dropping the precision, your network can still learn even despite the noise that's introduced by things getting discretized incorrectly. Um, and it's just an empiric, like there's no, I don't think there's theory that's good behind it, but empirically it, feel, it seems like you can reduce pre precision and still have networks to train correctly. The big con is that the gradients are sometimes incorrectly um, clipped then. And so I think a common trick is to do this gradient scaling. When you do reduced precision training, you essentially multiply every gradient by like 1,000 before you compute, uh, or you, you multiply your stuff by 1,000 before you compute the gradient, and then you divide it by 1,000 again and pass it on down into the other layers. So it's almost like when you do computation, you scale out the precision, and then when you don't need to do computation, you scale it back down. To, um, so that's the one thing to watch out for. But basically, I think the advice is like, if you can make 16-bit work, then you should probably use it. It probably will be better, because you can push bigger networks through. So I guess I want to go into the labs. Yeah.
I haven't heard of it yet, so I'm not sure. The question was, Uber released something called um, Ludwig yes, or two weeks ago. I haven't heard of it. Yep. Oh, interesting. So the question is, are there licensing concerns when you're using certain data sets and then actually deploying your chain model? So the common concern that people had um, when the deep learning revolution was kicking off is like ImageNet has a license that forbids commercial use. And ImageNet was obviously the thing that everyone was training on or training on and then fine tuning on their data a tiny bit. And so the question was, is it legally kosher to train on ImageNet and then release that network for commercial purposes? And as far as I know, there's never been a lawsuit or anything about it. Um, and so the <laughs> empirical answer is that it, it is kosher. Now, if you're using some data set that's like the authors of the data set are very precise that it's only for non-commercial use and they make a big deal out of it, then I would not use it for business purposes. But if it's kind of like a well-known data set like ImageNet, it seems like it's totally OK. Do you guys have other opinions about that? I think it's an interesting question. Um, and like I said, you can't have a defensible business if all you do is train on publicly ex available data. So in some sense, your weights will never be just a product of the public data, but they might have some information from the public data and then some information from your proprietary data. And I think it's an interesting question as to whether that's totally kosher or not. OK, yes, yeah, so it sounds like NVIDIA decided that pre-training is OK, but it's not OK to train a model only on the research data set and then serve it for commercial purposes, which I think that makes sense. Um, OK, so I wanted to go into the labs. We, it's 2.30 right now, and we have a next break coming up at 3.30. So we have an hour for labs. Um, so I guess let's just dive into it. The lab that we're going to do first is lab eight, testing and continuous integration. So I'm going to try to work in the Jupyter Hub instance here, and then hopefully it's fast enough. Is this text big enough to read for people in the back of the room? OK, so lab eight, testing and continuous integration. So you can get pull. I don't think you need to. So in this lab, what I want to do is we have the test for text recognizer where we run certain just sample images through it to make sure it makes sense to us. But now what we're going to do is add evaluation tests, which I called validation tests in the lecture. Uh, we're going to add linting to our code base. And we're going to set up continuous integration using Circle CI. And then we're going to see our commits pass or um, fail. So the first thing I want to talk about is linting. So linting is this idea of essentially static code analysis that either enforces certain stylistic decisions that your team has made or tries to find bugs via static analysis. So for example, you might be using a variable that was never defined. That's guaranteed to be a bug uh, that you don't have to execute the program to find. And then potentially, if you're using static type uh, annotation, it can perform static type checking to find even more of those type of bugs. So for example, you have a function that's supposed to take, uh, let's say, a float, but then you give it a string. That's going to fail. You can also perform static analysis to find security vulnerabilities. So for example, you can be using um, the eval command in Python, which literally evaluates as code whatever string you give it, huge security vulnerability, and it just alerts you to it. It might still be the right thing to do in your code base, but you should at least know about it and decide that it's kosher. 
And then do the same thing for shell scripts. Shell scripts is like a huge opportunity for uh, you know, rm-rf star. Just deletes everything. And uh, it'd be nice if we did some static analysis for stuff like that. And by the way, I linked to like a cool guide about bash scripts. So for a long time, I personally was afraid of bash scripts, but uh, they're very useful. So, you know, I wish that I was even better at them. Um, and for those of you that don't have a computer science background, like the only reason I'm comfortable at all with them is because one of the undergrad courses I had made us use it. But otherwise, I probably would never choose to use it myself, right? And then, OK, so let's just get into the linting. So in lab, I believe, 8, let's go into lab 8 solution. And let's just take a look at the files we have. So we have a new folder called evaluation. Inside of that folder, we have evaluate character predictor, evaluate line predictor. So this is that validation test that I was talking about. And then we have a new file in tasks called lint.sh. So let's go ahead and take a look at that one first. So lint.sh is a simple bash script. Um, it first does a pipenv check. So what pipenv check is, is essentially checks the exact versions of your packages for known security vulnerabilities. So every now and then, uh, a security vulnerability is found in a widely used package that like, the authors of that package messed up and there's a security vulnerability, but you're importing that package, so now you have a security vulnerability. And it's nice to know when that's true, so you can bump up the version of that package if possible. The next thing it does is pylint. And what this means is it's going to run pylint on the API folder, the text recognizer folder, and the training folder. And it's going to ignore this other folder um, because it has code we don't care about. Pylint is a, I think I describe it as a yeah, static analysis of Python files. And it reports both kind of style problems, like this line's too long, and, and potential bugs. Pylint is configured with uh, a thing called Pylint RC, which is just like a file that specifies like certain things that we care about or don't care about. So it's you know, read about it on your own time, but just know that pylint RC is actually used when you're running pylint here. Then we run pycode style, and we exclude certain things, and we also run an API text recognizer and training. So why is it important to do that? If you have a code base that you yourself are working on, uh, it's easy to just kind of use your own style and just not care about it. But then you start working with someone else or a team of people, and they have a different convention for code style. So you might not want to put spaces around equal signs, but they do want to put spaces around equal signs. And you're reviewing each other's code, and a lot of the time that you spend reviewing code, you're just fighting about the stylistic difference. You, know, you, say, you comment there, and you say, put, you know, put spaces around the, the equal signs. And then they say, like, no, why should I? So it's important to actually just codify that type of decision into a process. So the discussion you guys should have with your team is just like, Let's take a majority vote. Should there be spaces around equal signs or not? Once we decide, we encode that in our uh, coding convention, and then we have an automatic check for it so that it's not, valid, it's not a valid pull request. Like The code is not ready for review until it passes all the styling, style conventions. Um, MyPy is a cool thing. You guys might have seen the, that the code that we have is um, Where's a good example of this? Maybe in models. So we have these type annotations. We say data class, data set class is a, um, it's going to be a type of EMNIST data set. A network function is going to be a callable, which is another word for a function. A data set args is going to be a dictionary, and so on. And then potentially, if I have a function that returns something, I can say the type of the thing that it's going to return is a tuple of string and float, which in our case is like the string of prediction and a confidence. And MyPy is a cool program that essentially enforces that the types match up. So if somewhere in the code I've, I call 
this function, predict on image, and I only, let's say, um, like I, you, I, I, re I receive a, var a variable and then I use that variable in another function call, and if that function expects a string, but the thing that this function returns is a float, then my pie is gonna alert us to it. So it's quite nice for just caching stuff like that. Bandit is a security vulnerability. Shell check does the same for shells. So what does it look like to run it? Let's go back here. We can run tasks, lint, sh. Um, so it looks like we have a couple of a couple of problems here. Too many local variables in IAM paragraphs data set, for example. Um, so it also raised your code, which is quite nice. And so overall, the linting has failed. Um, on my, the, yeah, we're running this. We should probably actually run it in lab nine right here and see if it passes here. There's, there's different like parts, you know, each lab has a different subset of the code base and it kind of hard to make it work for all of them. But um, essentially the, 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 the thing is this script runs, it either returns true or false and then circle CI, which is our continuous integration solution can use that to report a build failure or a build pass. The next thing I want to cover is the, how to set up circle CI and also these evaluation tests. So like I said, we added evaluation, value character predictor, value line predictor, and then a little task to run them. So let's really briefly take a look at the code. <clears throat> so it's an evaluation. We have evaluate character predictor. We load our character predictor. We load our data set. And then we evaluate on the data set. This evaluate method automatically uses the test split of the data set. <clears throat> And then we return the, the accuracy metric and the time taken. And then we have a couple of asserts. So we want our metric to be greater than 0.6, 60%. And then we want the test to take less than um, 10 seconds here, right? And then similarly for valued line predictor, we actually test it on two different data sets. So this one's on EMNIST lines. And then this one is on the IM lines. And we just want to make sure it takes less than 60 seconds in one case, less than 90 seconds in another. So I think this is kind of worth pointing out real quick. Um, sometimes you introduce changes to your model that doesn't actually decrease accuracy, but it does make it a lot slower to execute. And I think it's important to keep track of both because it's, you, know, you should care about both in a deployed system. Um, so what I like to have is just kind of like have a floor on what's my lowest accuracy that I'm okay with, and what's my longest runtime that I'm okay with. So let's go ahead and run these things. Tasks run validation tests. This still uses PyTest as the code running framework. Okay, in this case, I don't have the right data set, so it's downloading the data set. So I think this is kind of cool because it's also really testing the, the, the data set pipeline. Like if something fails here, this test is also going to fail because it won't be able to run. You guys have any questions while this runs? Oh, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, I would say it's in its own kind of environment because your real production code might not need to run on batches of 
inputs at all. It might only need to serve single predictions. Um, whereas this validation set should definitely be running on batches of your input. And also the data set, like the data formatting and pre-processing code path might actually be different. So for a single instance, you might be formatting it in one code path. Whereas if you're extracting stuff from like a database um, or a data set that's stored on disk, it might already be processed correctly for the validation. So I think it's important to test both, and it's not important to have the code for the validation in the actual like deployed production model. So yeah, we're really downloading all the data right now. I kind of like that. Um, while it's going, I guess I will just kind of show you what the Circle CI thing looks like. So this is the FSDL text recognizer project. If you go to GitHub and you go to FSDL text recognizer project and you click fork, it'll make a fork of your own, right? And then I made a fork. This is me. Um, and I can set up CircleCI for this fork. So I can go to CircleCI.com, go to app. And then I want to change into my personal account, add a project, add my fork right here. And then it asks for like setup, but we already have it set up. We have a CircleCI config YAML, which I will show, guide you through in a second. I'll just click start building. And right away, okay, it starts running. Now, when it finishes running, it's going to be the same thing as what I see here. Um, so FSDL text recognizer project. I have the, the latest build is a success. When I click into it, I can see what actually happened. So it spun up the environment, checked out the code. Let's close this guy. Uh, restored cache. Installed git LFS, got the git LFS files, installed shell check, installed Python dependencies, um, cached the Python dependencies. OK, now it runs the linting. So it ran the linting, and it um, found some mistakes. But um, I actually set it up so that even if linting fails, it still reports a green build, because just for the demo purposes, I don't want to be a stickler. Then it runs the prediction tests. Um, which we can kind of review and see like what was the actual output. So we predicted do that in with confidence 0.15. The true was do that in. The edit distance is zero and so on. So it's kind of nice. It like keeps all your logs for you. And it runs the evaluation tests. That's the same thing that's running in, in here. And it just finished. So my evaluation test just finished. Three of them passed. Three out of three passed. And same thing here in Circle CI, three out of three passed. Uh, and then if I have some kind of test artifact, so for example, I could be producing an artifact about test coverage. So that means like how many, like what percent of all lines of code in my code base were exercised by the test that I ran. Um, so I could, I could upload my coverage report here. So that's Circle CI. The thing I want to cover now is how do we set it up? Um, and I believe it is in lab eight solution. Oh yeah, here, lab eight solution. Um, unfortunately, it's just a file, I believe, maybe here. Yeah, circle CI config. Let's see if we can find it. So yeah, I think, do you know if there's a way to show um, hidden files here. So maybe not. So this, this file starts with a dot, which hides it in the file browser, which is kind of annoying. But it's here. It's vim.circleci slash config yaml. And the, you know, remember the steps we saw was like check out the code, restore cache, install git LFS, pull git LFS files, install shell check, install dependencies. Okay, then here we go. Run linting. So we just do tasks lint sh, run prediction tests. We do pip and run pi test text recognizer tests, run evaluation test pip and run pi test evaluation. So um, there's not really much to it. It's just kind of bash commands. The 
build environment is actually Docker. And we start with a CircleCI Python 3.67 image. Um, and then on top of that image, we do all these like Git LFS installations. I didn't want to overwhelm people, but if I was actually doing like, if this was my code base for real, what I would do is I would have a Docker file for my CircleCI image, which essentially would start from this and then install Git LFS, um, install shell check, install the pipamp dependencies, and then I would Docker push that to something like you know, FSDL text recognizer circle CI image. And then in my actual circle CI config, I would say FSDL text recognizer circle, ima circle CI image. Um, and then I wouldn't need to do these steps because I know that my Docker image already has them. Does that make sense? So I wouldn't need to do these. I probably would still actually need to do this one just in case my dependencies change, but uh, it would be less work. So that is Circle CI. You guys have any questions about that? I think you know it's overall it's pretty basic, uh, a little bit of a pain to set up, but once you set it up, it's super nice to just be able to see a green build every time you push your code. Um, it gives you a lot of peace of mind. Yeah. So you said you only use the CPU, right? Yeah. Yeah, so because this is kind of like a demo repo, uh, the validation test is not so big. If your validation test was hundreds of thousands of images, this wouldn't be a viable solution. But the same idea would still be a viable solution, except you would just run it on some other machine, probably using BuildKite instead of CircleCI. But the basic ideas are still the same. Like there's steps like linting and prediction tests and evaluation tests. It just depends on where you run them. Um, at this point, I think we are done with lab eight, testing and continuous integration. Um, and then let's just kind of check up. Remember, I set, I set up CircleCI in my own fork, as you guys can do if you follow the instructions. And I just want to kind of check up on it. And it looks like it's running. It's uh, currently running prediction tests. So this is kind of cool to see. So it should finish up and be a green build for me pretty soon. And then if you guys start working in the repo and you start changing something and pushing to GitHub to your own fork, you'll see different builds. So let's move on to lab nine. So to get there, we go to FSDL text recognizer project repo, lab nine. Um, we don't have to do the solution, just do lab nine. So this one's about web deployment. So in this lab, what we're going to do is run our line predictor model. That's the one that takes a single image, predicts text in it. As a web application, uh, send it some requests just to see how we can kind of manually test it. We're going to dockerize the running web application. We're going to deploy our web application as a serverless function to AWS Lambda. And then we'll probably run out of time. But if we don't, we can try looking at some basic metrics, maybe try to set up some other metrics. and then. Uh, probably not going to get to this. OK. So let's check out lab nine. Let's close a bunch of these. So we'll go into lab nine. We'll open up lab nine here. So there's a new folder in lab nine um, called API. And inside of this API, there's a number of files. The ones that you're going to see, uh, I already ran something in here, so there's a little bit more files. But the ones that you will see are the Docker file, the serverless YAML, and the app.py. So let's start with app.py. And this is a simple web server uh, that essentially loads our prediction model and then responds to HTTP requests, serves predictions as, as HTTP responses. The kind of most commonly used uh, web application, or sorry, web server for Python is probably Flask. It's just very basic, very easy to get something going. Uh, and it's actually totally fine. I think lots of people probably just run it in production, sort of predictions that way. Um, there's a little bit of like a painful bug that we just have to go around, just a little bit of industry knowledge as to how to get around it. But the basic idea is that we have a route that's just the index, and we're going to return hello world to it. 
just as a health check, essentially. We have another round called slash v1 slash predict. Uh, the v1 is nice because what your deployed API should really be versioned because you might want to decide to like, just change up how you treat user requests. And the user should know that it's a different scheme now. So this is a v1 API with a predict endpoint. I will take get requests, and I will take post requests. And the difference there will be um, a get request will send a, it'll say, you know, hit the server predict endpoint with image URL equals some, um, some URL, so like an S3 URL. And then I will load the image from that URL and return you the prediction. So it's almost like you're looking up the prediction on this other resource. The post is different because this request, the client is actually going to encode the image data as binary data and send the binary data over to the server. Just a little distinction. But they're both um, using this interface called load image. So basically, if the method of the request is a post, then um, I will try to read it as a base64 encoded image. If the, method, uh, the request method is a get, then I will try to read this image as an image URL that can live on S3 or somewhere else. Um, and then that's pretty much it. When I run this app.py, it'll execute main, which will run the app on the 000 IP with the port 8000. So let's just go ahead and give that a try. So pip and run python api app.py. So it loads up the model. And it says, OK, I got my model loaded. I'm running on this uh, IP address. And please you know, send me a request. So at this point, what we'll do is we'll open up a new terminal. And we'll go back into FSDL text recognizer project, lab 9. <clears throat> We're going to export this variable called API URL just to point to that web server. And then we're, what we're going to do is we're going to make a post request to start with. So we're going to use curl, which is this kind of HTTP request command. Uh, going to make a post request. We're going to make a post request to API URL slash v1 slash predict to hit that endpoint. We're going to give it a, a JSON content type. And what it, the content type is going to be is we're going to say, OK, the image is this uh, base64 encoded image. And then we're going to base64 encode one of our test images, the one that says, or if you use the results. So it's a little bit of a handful to understand, but we're just going to do it. And bam, we got a response back, also JSON. Can you guys see? So we got a response back, also JSON. It says prediction, or if you use the results, which is perfect, um, and with a pretty low confidence, 0.05. Now, if I switch over to this terminal, I can see that I got this request right here. Um, so on the 3rd of March, 2252, I got a post request. And I can actually log, log what the request was. Do you guys have any questions about that? Yeah? Yeah, the question is, uh, could we set something up on our servers and that when an image comes in, we c like cache the computed results so that maybe the next time someone asks for that image, we just very quickly return the results? And the answer is like definitely, um, but it'll be like a caching layer on top of this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. So the question is, or the clarification, is that uh, the suggestion is that we should probably store the image that comes into our service so that maybe later we can look at the image and the prediction we made and use it in our training set for the future. And that's an excellent point. We should definitely do that. We should store the image. Like everything that comes in, we should probably upload to our database unless our end user agreement says we're not doing that um, and store the prediction we made in some database. And then every 
regular schedule, like every day, every week, every month. We just see everything that we've predicted on, uh, maybe label some of it, put it in our training set, retrain our model, deploy the new model, so that we get that data flywheel effect. And the more our service is being used by users, the more accurate it becomes and the more data it's able to predict on. So that's a very good point. I, I don't include that here because it's just a demo, but yeah, definitely would do that. Yeah, so the question kind of goes back to the Circle CI real quick, and I'll just cover that real quick. But the question was, you're starting from a Python Circle CI image, uh, but then one of the things you do is like install pip and pipenv. Like, doesn't the Python Docker image already have pip and pipenv? And the answer is yes, it does. But we may want the latest version of pip. So like, it has some version of pip but potentially a newer one came out since the Docker image was built. So I made the decision to just always be on the latest version of pip and pipenv. But you don't have to do that. So you don't have to do this. So um, proceeding with our lab nine, um, if, we, if I want to look at the image I just sent, by the way, I can kind of look at it here. Maybe I'll just show it in my... Um, it's this image right here, or have used the results. So the web server you'll notice is, is using that simpler EMNIST lines data set and loading that trained model. Um, if you guys wanted to use the paragraph text recognizer, you should definitely do that as a project. So that was a post request where we like encode the image in the request and send it to the server. The other thing that we may want to do is a get request. And a get request is literally like when I go to Reddit, I'm making a get request to Reddit. Right, um, And then here, what I will do is make a get request to my API URL, v1 predict, and then just give it a parameter saying, like, hey, image URL at this, please return the prediction on that. Oh, wrong window. So came back with the same thing, because it's the same image. I just uploaded that image to S3. I just wanted to show like, the two different ways of calling the server. Well, the confidence score is, um, we can look in the line predictor model. So predict, self-model predict an image. The model is line model CTC. So let's go to that. Line model CTC predict an image. We have that CTC function. You know, we'll load the image. We'll run it through the CTC decode. Um, the prediction is some CTC decoding thing. Uh, we decode it from integers to characters, join it. Then what is the, uh, what is the prediction confidence? This is what the pre pre uh, prediction confidence is. It's a little bit too much to get into right now, but it's just what I thought made sense for a CTC decode prediction. Because obviously, um, yeah, it's... We have bad models. Like this is a test code base, so you know we just ran this for like 16 epochs, and uh, it's just not a very good model at this point. It does the job, but it's not very confident yet. If you trained it for like 100 epochs and had a better network, you'd probably push that up. Um, but the idea is, the idea is more like once we start logging this um, confidence, the idea is like how does it change versus time, right? So if it's around this scale right now, and then all of a sudden it's like 0.99, then we should be alarmed. It doesn't necessarily matter whether it's 0.05 or 0.99 right now. It just matters how it changes with time. So going back to the thing, um, it says you can shut down your Flash server, so I'll do that. And then also we added a test specifically for the web server. So we have tests for the prediction system, but then we also have tests for the overall serving system. And it's this task test api.sh. Let's give it a shot. Let's see what it actually says. It says pip and run pytest api. Let's run that. And let's open up the test. So this is test app. 
It really just tests the predict thing. It just loads an image, encodes it in base64, and then makes uh, essentially like a fake request to the web server. It passes, so that's kind of all we need to care about right now. You guys should feel free to dig into the code on your own time. The next thing I want to get to is how do we run this web server in Docker? So what we're doing now is we're running it on our machine using Pipound, which is great, because at least the Python dependencies are, are managed. But what if we want to package it up as a Docker container, send it to, to our DevOps people for deployment? Um, so through the magic of, I don't know what, we're going to build a Docker container. Uh, we're going to build a Docker image inside of what this is, which is actually also a running Docker container. So I think that's cool. So the, the task is build API Docker. Let's briefly look at what that actually is. So it's in tasks, build API Docker. So the first thing we do is we pip and block dash dash requirements which generates a requirements.txt file from our pip and block file. And we just save that in API slash requirements.txt. And this is simply because I don't want to mess around with pip and in Docker. I just want to be able to pip dash r requirements.txt in there. Just a small thing. Um, the next thing we do is a little bit of a hack, uh, which is actually change the TensorFlow dash GPU version to just the TensorFlow version because do, like, do, well, like I said, native Docker doesn't have GPU access, and so it's going to fail unless we use NVIDIA Docker. But since we're actually doing like CPU prediction anyway, we don't even need GPUs. And TensorFlow is kind of annoying in that it has like two different packages. So anyway, don't worry about that. But in the requirements, we just change TensorFlow GPU to TensorFlow. And then we do Docker build, um, tag the image that we're building with the name text recognizer API and we use the file API Docker file. This is the Docker file that we're using. So start from the latest long-term support Ubuntu version, Ubuntu 18.04. Install pipenv, bam. Create working directory, uh, make dear slash repo. Copy only what we need for this production system from our code base into this Docker container. So all we need is text recognizer folder and the API folder. We don't need the training folder. We don't need the evaluation folder. We don't need the notebooks. We just need the model code and weights, which is in text recognizer. And we need the web server code, which is an API. Then we install Python dependencies. This is like an annoying thing about pip. Uh, but basically, this is the relevant command here. We expose the port number 8,000, which is the default Flask web port. We say, OK, Python path is going to be slash repo, because that's where all the code is. And then we're going to run Python repo API app.py. So just like we ran pip and run Python app.py, we're going to do Python API app.py here. OK, so it successfully built this text recognizer Docker. By the way, we can take a look at what it did, right? Um, Well, there's a lot, but you can see like these 12 steps, they correspond to the lines of the Docker file. So there's 12 command lines in the Docker file. So this last one is this one. And that's where the caching comes in. Like if, let's say we change line 11, but nothing above it, then everything above it will just be cached and nothing will be done. And then everything 11 and below it will be rebuilt. So, OK, it took a couple of minutes to complete, complete, and it's done. When it's finished, you can run the server with docker run map port 8000 on our local machine to port 8000 in the running Docker container. Name it API. Um, this just, like, give it an interactive terminal. Uh, remove the container after you're done executing it, just kind of boilerplate. But this is the important thing. Like, what is the name of the Docker image that we should run? It's text recognizer API. So we're going to run the Docker container. And it's running. It's really exciting. 
Um, are you guys excited? <laughs> I'm excited. So we're going to start another terminal, go back into the same place that we were in, and then just going to um, do the same thing we did before. So we're going to API URL is the same. It's still serving predictions on localhost at port 8000, except now it's going to be forwarding that request to inside of Docker. Um, but I'll export that. And then I will make the post request. I got the result. And the get request, I got the result. I can check inside a terminal that it actually, this is the get request. This is the post request. It's running inside of Docker. Um, and then here's another thing that I want to cover in just a little bit, which is it's logging the confidence and the mean intensity of the image. So this will help us maybe be alert for a data distribution shifts. Do you guys have questions at this point? Yeah? Uh, do you know any ways of like, making this Docker file from the system that you already have? Like, the question is, is there a way to make a Docker file that just reproduces the system you're currently on? I don't think so, because there's so many variables to the system you're currently on that it, it, I think it's just too difficult. Like, let's say you're in Ubuntu, but you've installed like, so many packages. And then on Docker, you can say from Ubuntu, but then you got to figure out like, all the installed packages. Like, maybe there is a way. But you probably also don't want to do that, because you really want to install the bare minimum of packages that's, that's, that's necessary for your deployment. I think maybe, but yeah, I, I don't know. I think it seems daunting, and I, you know, it does seem daunting, like writing Docker file. But it's it's actually pretty easy once you get into it. It's just a little bit of experimentation. Are you logging the metrics the same way you log um, like an input picture? Could you repeat that? So when somebody sends a, a picture that they want you to predict. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't necessarily log the picture, because logging is usually for like text files. I would upload, so in a full like web service that's like serving image predictions, every image that comes in, I would upload to my own S3 bucket. I would probably log the ID that it got on S3, right? Um, and I would log certain things about my prediction. So in that sense, yes, I definitely want to link my prediction to the image, but it doesn't make sense to log the image. It makes sense to upload the image somewhere because it's a binary file. OK, so if needed, I can connect to my running Docker container by typing this. I'm not going to do that. Um, you can shut down your Docker container now. OK, we could shut it down, although I'll miss it. But uh, we could also deploy this container to, like for example, AWS Elastic Container Service. Um, or even something more advanced like Fargate or Kubernetes, and uh, you know, go, go wild and do it. In this lab, we'll try to deploy the app as a package to AWS Lambda. All right. So let's kill this Docker container. <clears throat> so we're using this framework for deploying to Lambda that we call, or that's called serverless. Um, Well, serverless. The most widely adopted toolkit for building serverless applications. Um, it just has a, a bunch of nice stuff. And it, it, it is, I think, I was saying about vendor lock-in something yesterday. Um, and this is a thing that's supposed to kind of fight vendor lock-in. You're supposed to be able to define your serverless function in a format that you can easily deploy to either AWS or Azure or Google Cloud Platform or even other stuff. Um, so the reason we're using it in the lab is because there's a lot of boilerplate that you have to write for specifically Lambda deployment. And I didn't want to get into it. Um, but with serverless, there's actually not that much boilerplate to write. So it's defined as a YAML file. It has a name. When you open it in your thing, it'll say text recognizer dash 
username or something like that. So you can replace it with um, your own name. Let's call it Sergey, I guess. Um, what do we actually want to package? We want to package nothing except for app.py and the text recognizer, all the files in text recognizer. We want to deploy to AWS. We want to deploy to the US West 2 region. We want to have the Python 3.6 runtime. Our max memory size is going to be three gigabytes, just to be comfortable. Our timeout is going to be 30 seconds. Uh, we're not going to version functions, just because this is a demo. And then there's a neat thing. There's a plugin called serverless WSGI, which basically means if you have a Flask app that like, you've tested out as a Flask app, you can just deploy that app as a Lambda function, and stop, like, the plugin will figure out how to route everything correctly, which is really convenient. It's not, probably not something I would use in actual production, but it's nice for a demo. And then we're also going to use a plugin called serverless Python requirements, which will help us package up all the Python packages and stuff um, into a nice zip file. So one of the things that it's going to do is it's actually going to build the Python packages in a Docker container that is exactly the Lambda environment. So there is a LambCI um, Lambda Docker or something. So um, some nice people figured out exactly all the kind of libraries and everything that's on AWS Lambda runtime. And they made a Docker container that has exactly that. And they keep it updated. So basically, if we compile everything on this container, it should be exactly the versions that are like optimized and used on uh, AWS Lambda. So that's what this Dockerized pip means. Slim means that we will um, delete a whole bunch of files that aren't necessary, like egg info and uh, stuff like that. Um, dist, dist info, something like that. Like Python outputs more files than you actually need. We're also going to delete TensorBoard because we don't need it, but TensorFlow brings it in. We're going to delete all the TensorFlow contrib because we don't need it, but it takes a lot of space. And we don't need any tests at all, so we'll delete all the tests from all the packages. And uh, we're going to zip it up. So let's see if that works. I think I say go into API, run npm install. Okay. Up to date, I already installed it. We set up serverless. Now we should run SLS info. Let's do that. Uh, this command can only be run in a, oh, OK, sorry. I should go into API, npm install. OK, still nothing to do. SLS info. OK, it says there's a service called Text Recognizer Sergey. Um, and it already has an endpoint because I already deployed before the lab. Um, but if you haven't deployed, then you should set up your AWS credentials with your key and your secret key. These are fake. Don't worry about it. But basically, when you sign up for AWS, you will um, have an access key and a secret access key. Don't ever share them with anyone or check them into any repository. Last year, we made. Uh, I am accounts for all the attendees. And then a bunch of people checked in their secret credentials into GitHub. So uh, we're not doing that this year. But on your own time, you can make an AWS account or just use the one you already have, set it up. And then the money command is pip and run serverless deploy. Let's give it a shot. So what this will do is it'll make all the requirements um, in a dot serverless folder. It'll in a Docker, in, like it'll put requirements.txt in the service folder. In a Docker, install everything from the requirements.txt, strip out the stuff we don't want, zip it up into a package, and then upload it to AWS Lambda, set up a uh, REST endpoint to hit the Lambda container, <clears throat> and then basically be ready to accept requests. I can show you briefly what that looks like. Um, so here I have my AWS account. I have Lambda, so I have, why do I have to zoom in every single page? I have this Sergey Dev API. It's 95 megabytes. Um, it got automatically configured by the serverless code. 
but I can confirm that it's Python 3.6 and uh, takes, oh, I guess the memory wasn't set correctly, but it should be 3008. Timeout is in 30 seconds, whatever. Um, I can see if it's been called in monitoring. This one has not, but I have one I think that has. Something's going on. <laughs> okay, let me see. Um, AWS, Lambda, this guy, monitoring, one week. So yeah, at some point I was uh, testing this, and so I was making requests. You can see it made five invocations to the service. Um, the duration of the invocations, three seconds, on average, the max was 14 seconds. The min was 0.47, probably because it was breaking. Um, how many errors did it generate? Throttles is an interesting thing. So like, let's say your max concurrency is 10,000 requests per, or 10,000 concurrent requests. Um, if the 10,000 and first request comes in, then it'll get throttled. So Lambda will tell it like, hey, I can't execute you. Um, and it'll show up here. And um, Yeah, let's see what, how this is going. It's packaging the Lambda up. Uploading the service to S3. Do you guys have any questions so far? Is this in all three arrests as well? I mean, there is a point. Yeah, exactly. It'll be the exact, like the API URL will just be some HTTPS Amazon URL but we'll call it exactly the same way as we have been calling our local server. Yeah. Um, so I have my Docker images like managed on uh, Amazon CR. Uh -huh. um, like, is there like a convenient way of going to Lambda from the CR? Well, so the, you can't deploy Docker directly onto Lambda. Okay. You have to package up Lambda as like a separate thing. All right, so now we're going to export this new URL. So this is the Lambda URL as our API URL. And then make a, the same request that we have been making before. And then see if it works. So it probably takes a while now because of that cold start problem. So like, yeah, we deployed it, but that doesn't mean there's any actual compute power allocated to it. But then, you know, within 10 seconds or so, we got our result back. And if we try the other method of posting, Uh, I think I'm in the wrong folder. There we go. Yeah, and it still works. And we can now go into our Lambda here, this new one that we deployed. This one's a little wonky. Let's just go into CloudWatch. That's the monitoring and logging solution. We can look into logs. This is the one. Um, <coughs> We can see the log of the function, and um, we can see that it's logging the confidence and intensity. We can see all the requests that are making, how long it took, 15 milliseconds, and so on. We can look at a graph of that stuff. So lambda by resource. So invocations, and let's say duration. So I can graph let's say the sum of all invocations and the average duration over the last hour. And I guess I'll just make more requests to it so that it has some more invocations. Um, and then that will be reflected here. Um, they'll start showing up. So I just wanted to cover that because it's a quick and dirty way to just deploy your trained things and have the rest of your team or your mom play with it. And uh, it's not necessarily what you'd want to do in production. You'd probably want to wrap it in your own infrastructure code 
but it is a good way to understand like the basic building blocks of stuff. Um, there's another section on monitoring that I honestly don't think we should tackle today. Um, let's just break for, do a break, go for a break early. But it is something that you can do on your own, and it basically guides you through setting up that kind of data distribution shift uh, metric through setting up a log metric alarm. Do you guys have any questions? Cool, so let's just call it good here and then meet up back here at four. And then another thing we wanna do actually is take a picture with all of you, um, either outside or on the stairs there. So we'll make an announcement about it out there. Thank you.